Iran is now enriching uranium beyond the limits set in the 2015 nuclear deal. Hello, I'm Arlen Vidum and this is The Heat. Iran made good on its promise this weekend to surpass the uranium enrichment limit set by the landmark nuclear accord. Tehran says it will continue to scale back on its commitments every 60 days unless the remaining signatories, Britain, China, France, Germany and Russia, protect it from economic sanctions imposed by the United States. Europe had pledged to help Iran but has been unable to avert the U.S. sanctions that are now crippling Iran's economy. The road to negotiations and diplomacy is open, but the important thing is to find innovations and solutions to meet our demands mostly in relation to oil and banking. U.S. President Trump pulled out of the nuclear accord in 2018 and reinstated economic sanctions. Tensions have escalated in recent weeks after Tehran shut down an American drone. Fears of a military conflict remain high in the region. Well, for more on the Iran nuclear deal, let's bring in our panel. Joining us here in the studio is Reza Akbari. He's a program manager at the Institute for War and Peace Reporting in Washington, D.C. Also with us is Paolo von Chirac. He's the president of the Global Policy Institute. From Tampa, Florida, Mohsen Milani is the executive director with the Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies at the University of South Florida. And James Carafano is vice president of the Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Thank you to all of you for being with us. Mohsen Milani, let me start with you. Iran has again responded to the U.S. withdrawal from the nuclear agreement uh, and the imposition of new sanctions uh, by uh, enriching more uranium than allowed for under that nuclear deal. This is what the Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani, had to say. Let's watch. All the steps that we are taking can be reversed in the space of one hour to the previous terms of the agreement. Why are you so worried? We have told you that if you carry out your part of the deal, then we will return to the starting point. So, Mr. Minow, what is Iran, Iran hoping to achieve by breaching these limits? Iran hopes to uh, obtain as much leverage as it possibly can in case it has to negotiate with the U.S., Iran does not want to negotiate with the U.S. under pressure, and when it does not have any winning card, Iran and the U.S. agreed uh, to the nuclear deal four or five years ago, precisely because at that time, Iran was enriching uranium at 20 percent and had more than 19,000 centrifuges. Now, today, Iran doesn't have any of that, doesn't have any stockpile of low enriched uranium and none of the 20 percent enriched uranium. And therefore, Iran is trying to go step by step to distance itself from the nuclear agreement because it believes that if the nuclear agreement is not a win-win, win for Iran, win for the global powers, then it is not a good deal. And therefore, Iran is trying to increase its leverages in case it has to negotiate with the U.S. in a future date. James, as we heard, Iran wants to increase its leverage, its power to negotiate. Is this a strategy that's going to work by breaching these limits? Well, I, he could well be right. I mean, I, I always say, I'm reluctant to say this is what the Iranians are thinking, because to be honest, I don't know what they're thinking. All we can do, if you don't have intelligence, or is listen to what they say and look at their past behavior. So that scenario kind of makes sense, right? The, the notion that somehow, by doing this, the Iranians are going to pressure the Europeans to pressure the United States to lift sanctions. I don't think anybody thinks that's realistic. Indeed, what might happen is it might trigger a dispute resolution, which then might actually lead to more UN sanctions. So, but on the other hand, I think from an Iranian perspective, yeah, it, it is in a sense a bargaining chip to increase the capability that they have. That's pressure. And let's run the scenario. If President Trump doesn't get reelected, they might get a U.S. president who is much more willing to go back to something similar to what they had. Indeed, several of the, the opposing candidates have already said they would rejoin JPCO, so that's a possibility. And on the other hand, if Trump gets reelected, are they really worse off? Trump says he wants to negotiate. They'll be negotiating with him, I think, from their perspective, from a, from a stronger position than that they just sit around for a year and a half and get pummeled.
Paolo, where does this leave the Europeans? There are several European countries that are signatories to this agreement. Uh, right now we have the French president, Emmanuel Macron, who's taking the lead in Europe. He wants to reopen negotiations with the Iranians. He's sent his envoy to Tehran. He's hoping that there'll be some kind of dialogue that'll start by the middle of this month. Uh, what will new negotiations achieve? Well, look, uh, Europe is quite frankly not in a very strong position uh, in this uh, situation. Of course, European countries were part of the agreement, as we all know, and they were very, very uh, openly displeased with the actions of the Trump administration when he denounced the agreement and said, we are, we are withdrawing from this, and said, now we have to sell, which we tried to do our best. And of course, uh, the Europeans tried, uh, at least at the very beginning, to oppose uh, the sanctions, and then they realized that they really couldn't because uh, it's uh, doing business with us, said Trump, or do it with Iran. Good luck to you. You want to do business That's with Iran? That's a very Iran? stark choice, in yes, fact. Uh... Indeed. And, and so right now, I think, quite frankly, and I'm being a little cynical here, it's noise. There's n the Europe doesn't have any bargaining chips, doesn't have any real leverage on Washington. I don't think so. I, I think Washington is quite determined in this policy, which is to bring Iran down on its knees. Let's be frank. There is no, well, let's do put a little pressure so that the Iranians will be nice and come back to, you know, to, to discuss things in a more congenial fashion. America is aiming at the strangulation of the Iranian economy. And I do not believe that Europe, with all, whatever its diplomatic overtures and sending envoys and trying to make peace and what have you, has much to, uh, to bargain with quite frankly. And, and we could see a new UK government flip yes. inside with the Americans, even Absolutely. further splitting the European And by the way, Europe right now is still in a mess. They're trying to get their appointments of chief leaders. In, in other words, issues which are completely extraneous to Iran, but absorb the energies and the resources, trying to get the appointments through of a, the new president of the commission, the new head yeah. of the central bank. There is Brexit, you know, still ongoing in, in a messy way. Iran is a huge disturbance, but I'm not quite sure that Europe has a strategy. Mohsen Milani, do you agree that uh, the Iranians really have no choice in this? They're going to have to deal with the United States because the Europeans are not going to save them. Well, I agree that uh, Europe cannot help Iran a great deal, although Europe can help a little bit in the short term. If this uh, a system that they have set up, Instex, if they agree to allow this to operate mm -hmm. and then allow it to expand its operation, that is to allow Iran to deal with European uh, companies, small European companies, then there is enough time, Iran will have enough time to perhaps make a revision of its policies. But look at it this way, Iran really has no choice but to uh, increase its pressure on Europe and the US. For a, year and, for a year and a half, that is, after President Trump withdrew from the nuclear deal and imposed crippling sanctions, Iran basically resisted America in a very peaceful way. They have decided that doesn't work, and therefore they have started what I call active resistance against the U.S. And their thinking is that if we continue with our nuclear program the way we did, prior to uh, the signing of the nuclear deal. And if we continue with our regional policies, then we have some leverage, and perhaps the U.S. will come to its senses and agree to uh, either come back right. to uh, uh, the nuclear deal, but more importantly, at least agree to lift some of the sanctions so that the two sides can go back to the negotiating table, which I believe is the only viable solution for Iran and for the U.S. if they are determined to prevent a military confrontation in that region. Right. Reza, what is your view on this? Do you think these, uh, the Iranian strategy of these incremental increases in uh, enriching uranium will work? Um, well, it's really hard to uh, uh, figure out where it's going to go. Uh, I, and I more or less agree with uh, Dr. Milani when he's talking about Iran trying to gain leverage. I think another way of framing it would be raising the cost. Uh, for, for U.S. and what they believe to be, you know, European inaction when it comes uh, to them, to the Europeans, you know, providing some economic benefits, financial benefits to Iran. The uh, INSTEC system that has been set up, Iranians uh, believe that it has not had any tangible outcomes. It's just 
frankly taking forever. And instead of them just sitting and twiddling their thumbs, which uh, seems to be uh, something that Europeans are arguing for when they say Iran should actually still abide by the deal, when the Trump administration says that Iranian uh, you know, actions are uh, you know, very aggressive and yeah. they should be set back. So to be honest, I don't think Iran has that many options left. They have to incrementally increase what they still believe is not actually negating the deal. Iran is adamant about arguing that these are within their rights, within the clauses that have been put within the agreement, and it's something that they are within the rights to do so. So either raising the costs, uh, as I would like to say, or gaining leverage for future negotiations seems to be more or less the only, lever uh, only opportunity for Iran. Um, and, and I think they're also trying to indicate that they're willing to walk the walk. You know, we have right. seen some aggressive you know, behavior by the Iranians. Um, frankly, I was surprised when, uh, when the drone was shut down. I, I wouldn't have thought that they're willing to actually go that far. But I think they are, uh, this is something that, you know, has been par part of the Iranian mantra, that they are only going to negotiate from a position of strength. And I think they are trying to regain that position, regain that upper hand any way they possibly can. Um, so that's, I think, where we are for the time being. James, the rhetoric coming out of Washington seems to be getting a bit heated as well. We had uh, Vice President Mike Spence talk uh, about this, and this is what he had to say. Let's watch this. Iran should not confuse American restraint with a lack of American resolve. We hope for the best, but the United States of America and our military are prepared to protect our interests and protect our personnel and our citizens in the region. We will continue to oppose Iran's malign influence. We will continue to bring pressure on their economy. And under President Donald Trump, America will never allow Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon. That was the United States Vice President Mike Pence talking there. Uh, what do you make of that, James? Oh, there's nothing new there, other than maybe the, the, the pointed finger pointing. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are all things the U.S. has said before. The, the, every president said we we're not going to tolerate Iran becoming a nuclear power, um, stating that if Iran attacks U.S. personnel or assets, that the U.S. would defend them. That's a completely unremarkable statement. So. There's not, if, there's not really any escalatory language there. And I think we've seen pretty good evidence that, that both sides have demonstrated that they don't want a military escalation. I, I agree. Iran just cannot sit around for 18 months and do nothing, right? So this is a part of the world where, you know, if you're not tough, you're on the menu. Mm -hmm. and, and so they just can't look feckless, right? So they have to do something. So they've come up with a strategy for, at least externally, it appears, to show that they are pushing back, possibly strengthen their position for future negotiations, but not put them in a position where they're on an escalatory ladder that gets them right. to a place they really can't right. afford to go. And I think one, one thing that's very important as well, that one of the issues with the framing uh, uh, that uh, Mr. Uh, Vice President Pence yeah. mentioned, and some you know, media reports the same way, Iran is not on this mad dash right. towards getting a nuclear weapon. I think the steps thus far have been very calculated and calibrated. Um, and they have, they're incrementally you know, reacting to what was the original action by the US administration. So I think that's also uh, important to, to remember that Iran is not going to right. you know, get well, a nuclear weapon tomorrow. We are not on the right path, that's however. A, that's uh, a really important point. I mean, people talk about this as this is some kind of conveyor belt, right. and JPCOA was some kind of break or something. Mm -hmm. But the Iranians have always been in control of their nuclear program, and they're going to decide how fast or slow it progresses. If, if, if I may, I mean, it seems to me that the real issue here is a disaster of the Iranian economy. And to the extent that they, you know, send these messages, are we going to increase this a little bit? Are we going to do this a little bit? Because they want the Europeans to be afraid. The Europeans are close to the theater. The Europeans don't want another crisis in the Middle East. And they think that somehow the Europeans may deliver something, as in uh, uh, new financial arrangements and transactions and trying to uh, relieve the burden of the American sanctions, which are biting very, very severely. Everything that I hear from Iran is that the economic situation, the hardships of the people are really, really 
uh, increasing. And I think that, this, uh, that the Iranian government is running out of options. And this may be one last uh, Hail Mary, as we would say, pass to say, hey, maybe this is going to stick. I'm afraid this is not going to work. There is a mechanism in place which is called instex. Why are the Europeans reluctant to use that? Because they know that there, there will be consequences here. Very simple. They, it's a bluff. It's, a, it's an idea to say, well, you know, we are not going to stand by this thing. We are not part of, the, of this American idea of the sanctions. So we are going to separate ourselves right. from the Americans. They are friends, allies, but on this thing we politely disagree. The fact is that the United States has made perfectly clear that either we, you do business with us or with Iran. Right. You can dress it up the way you want. You can create all the new instruments and, and nice uh, whatever uh, you know, modalities to circumvent the sanctions. In the end, the risk, America, in other words, European companies, especially large multinationals that have huge global business interest and, and investments here in the United States are not going to go there. I very much doubt that you will see Siemens and, you know, and SAP and Bosch and Renault and everybody, oh, oh, well, in this case, we can do this, right? Yes. If Brussels says it's okay, then we're going to do it. And then hear it back from Washington and say, we're closing you down in the United States. All right. Not a great, not a great bargain. Mohsen well, Milani, have the Iranians run out of uh, options, or do they have uh, some other kinds of leverage? For instance, could they threaten uh, oil shipments in the Gulf? Well, that they can do. Uh, I think they still have some options. If you go back to the day when the Iranians uh, shut down the American uh, drone and then uh, see why the President of the United States decided not to retaliate, I think there is a reason why he decided not to retaliate. Maybe it is not the reason that everybody is talking about, but I really think the President decided that in case he retaliates, the Iranians might retaliate, and then things get out of control. The Iranians are making it very clear to the regional players, to Saudi Arabia, to the United Arab Emirates, to Bahrain, to Qatar, to Iraq, to Syria, that in case there is a war, everybody is going to pay the price. Iran of today is not Iraq of 1990. Iran has over 200,000 Shia militias in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen. And they are going to use those in case there is an attack. This is why everybody is concerned, and everybody should be concerned, trying to find a solution, a peaceful solution to this nightmare. Because as I said, if there is a war, it is not going to be a war between the US and Iran alone. Iran does have some missiles, and those missiles I believe, will be used, as Iran demonstrated that a few weeks ago when they shut down the American drone. Yeah. If, I'm, Please go ahead. Go ahead. If, if I may, mm -hmm. I don't think that the American strategy is to go to war with Iran. I don't think that we're planning or gearing up for a war. I believe firmly and uh, that the United States has a plan to bring Iran on its knees through economic sanctions. And I think so far it's working. It's not perfect, and it may not be in the time frame that is desirable or, or you know, optimal for the administration. Right. Right. But I don't think that, that uh, this thing leads to war. This may lead to, the, uh, to the, uh, some kind of capitulation, as it happened at the time when the big negotiations started. But this was because everybody was on the sanctions, America, Europe, and everybody. And the Iranians said, help, help. OK, yeah. we negotiate. Now it's America okay. alone doing it. But it's working. So I want to agree, but I want to, I, I think, explain the, the U.S. response to shooting mm -hmm. down the drone a little differently. Mm -hmm. I think from the U.S. perspective, it's really important that they not over-respond or over-aggress, because that puts more pressure on the Europeans, because then every time there's an escalation, the Iranians look like the bad guy, and therefore the Europeans are more and more forced to align with the U.S. So I think from that perspective, the U.S. can afford to be restrained and proportional. The other thing which I think is really interesting is the U.S. made some asymmetrical responses. Symmetrical is you shoot down our drone, we blow up your missile, right? But according to some reports, the U.S. did some cyber attacks. I think the seizure of the um, tanker, the tanker okay. uh, at the Gibraltar by the British on behalf of the Americans was really interesting because that had nothing to do with the Iranian sanctions. That had to do with the sanctions on Libya. Completely different situation. Powerless of the Europeans to do anything. If they intervened in that, they would totally look feckless. And it was another way the Americans, mm. dude, we haven't taken you to zero yet. 
but we know where zero is, and we can find other ways to get there. But James, I'm wondering, could you one blunder into a war, bluster into a war here? Because if, say, oil shipments are threatened, uh, how big an escalation would that be seen as in the United States? Well, that's where I think the US has to be smart. And yeah. I think it, they're not going to take the Iranian economy to zero. That would be a huge mistake, right? Um, and I think taking the, the tanker was just a symbol. It's like, dude, there's more we can do. And look, the Iranians have, this is a regime that is used to struggle. I mean, they right, fought a, right. a, a war in isolation mm -hmm. against the Iraqis forever. They know how to dig through tough times. I don't think the US is worried about this regime surviving in the next 18 months. Right. They know they're trying to wait them out, and they know, and they know the, the Iraqi regime can do that. So they're, so they're just, I think they'd make a mistake if they squeeze too hard. I actually personally have a big problem with the argument that the sanctions are working. I think, um, I think any student of international relations would tell you that sanctions are a tool uh, for you to use to reach an objective. I believe the Trump administration's objective is messy and confusing at best, and at worst, there is no objective. Um, so for us to be able to say, yes, sanctions are working because Iran is cornered, was the ultimate objective to corner Iran? No, and, I think it's to get them the back end. to a better Right, but, yeah. but I, don't, I don't think there are any signals or signs for the time being, at least publicly, that we see that Iran is willing to come back to the table Look, uh, and, and, and renegotiate. So sanctions, I think, unfortunately, this is not even just about Iran. I think it's just a tool uh, in the toolbox of uh, US foreign policy makers typically that um, in absence of a better option, sanctions is the first thing we go to. And they've no, just I, become an no. end. No, no, I, just, I, I think they've just no. become an I, end I, I, and, I on, on their no. own without, without a no, clear I, The US objective point. is to get the Iranians back to do a better deal. They just yeah. don't care if it happens right now. They don't care if it happens two years from now. And the other thing that's really key is um, you have to look at the, uh, the US strategy towards Iran and North Korea in, in tandem, because the strategy for both is identical. So. But, so they can't, yeah. I mean, they're going to pressure the North Koreans. They can't give the North Koreans a sweetheart deal because at the end, they want to turn to the Iranians and say, we pressured the North Koreans. They came to the table. Well, that's do. a huge issue as well. Okay. But Reza, have the same it, strategy that, for North I'll, Korea I'll and Iran. <laughs> yeah, Reza, would it be May fair I to say, point, yes. yes, I'll get to you uh, in a moment, Marcin. Would it be fair to say that the Iranians are saying, we will come back to the negotiating table, but we want to have a say in the terms of the, those negotiations? I'm, 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 I think, I think uh, to just reiterate the point I already made, mm -hmm. is Iran, of course, wants to, to come to the table in its own terms, right? And I think um, it's, it's a very hard, uh, you know, kind of thing for Iran to swallow. They were already at the yeah. table. I think yeah. we more or less all agree there was a deal signed and, yeah. and, and, the, and the president, you know, negated it, the U.S. president, for whatever reasons that, that those may have been. And I mean, I guess it's possible for Iran at some point to come back to the table, we'll never, table never say never. Yeah. But I think thus far what we've seen is just been, you know, repeated escalations okay. by both sides which I think, as you alluded to, is an incredibly dangerous game to, to play when we can easily stumble into uh, what, what will be, I personally think, hell, hell in the Middle East if we right. actually get to the point that there's going to be you know, a, a fallout military escalations and Iran's right. asymmetrical powers that, that Dr. Milani was pointing out to. Okay. Iran will not you know, just kind of well, sit down and take it. Go ahead, Mohsen Milani. Yes, uh, the, the conventional wisdom in Washington is that during President uh, Obama, the international sanctions were so crippling that Iran decided to uh, come to the negotiating table. And if we have a similar situation, keep pressuring Iran, then Iran is going to come back and accept uh, zero enrichment. It is very important to point out that the negotiation between President Trump, President Obama, and the Iranians started in secret about five and a half years ago. And during those secret negotiations, the United States made two pledges. Number one, they agreed to accept enrichment of uranium in Iranian soil. And secondly, they agreed to get the idea of regime change out of the, uh, out of the table. And as a result of those two major concessions by the US, then the negotiations between Iran and six global powers started. What we need today is a compromise by the Iranian as well as by the United States. Sanctions for the uh, sake of sanctions is not going to work. If by work you mean bring Iran to the negotiating table, it is working 
because it is destroying the Iranian economy. Well, but no Iranian leader is going to come to the negotiating table when they feel they're being pressured. There has to be a way to, to allow Iran to receive some concessions so that they can come to the negotiating table. Well, I mean, that, that's entirely possible, and this is sort of the art of diplomacy. But it seems to me that you are actually saying that the sanctions are working. That's exactly what the Americans want. They want no, to create. They, they want to create severe hardships uh, in in Iran. Now, the fact that it's not, uh, how, how can I say, politically savvy for Iranian leaders to say, "Help, help! Sorry, we had enough. Can't do this anymore. Uh, help us out. We'll negotiate. We'll sign anything." Of course, they're not going to do that. But they are mm -hmm. feeling the pressures. There, there, there is unrest in Iran. The situation is not, I would say, uh, out yeah. of control. But it's uh, it's kind of dicey, and and I am not quite sure how much more, how much longer they can uh, afford to be under these uh, constraints. Right. And back to what we were uh, saying, discussing earlier about the Europeans, of course the Europeans don't like any of this. They would like this whole thing to go away yeah. tomorrow, yesterday oh. possibly. Yeah. They would love, love to go back to the good days that were, you know, subsequent to the agreement yeah. when Federica Mogherini was going to Tehran looks like she was going to a wedding and she was saying oh my god this is so great we're gonna oh, we, America, uh, U European companies are right. be able to come and do all these gr great things etc and now of course this whole thing is gone thanks to Trump and the Europeans don't like a little bit of this but do they have tools I don't really think so can they really help in a substantial way to alleviate the tensions to, okay. to create another path I don't think so Dr. Milani, very quickly, I've got about a minute left. I know you want to respond to this. Very quickly, two important things. When the U.S. got out of the nuclear deal, the conventional wisdom in Washington was that there is no way Iran is going to get out of the nuclear deal. There is no way they're going to violate its provision. Now we know they have violated those provisions. The point, the important point is that when you do not have a political objective, when you do not have a political objective uh, for your campaign, for your pressure campaign, you can claim victory because you do not have an objective. If the objective of the pressure was to bring Iran to the negotiating table, it has failed. If the objective of the sanctions was to, uh, to force Iran to stay in the nuclear deal, it has failed. But if the objective of the sanctions is to deprive the Iranian people of economic well-being, if the objective was yeah. to, to make Iranian people poor, yes, it has succeeded. And I'm very sorry that it has succeeded. And that's where we are going to have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Thank you. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.